following program is recorded content created by the Truth Network. It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at karm.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers. Taking your calls and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone, welcome to the show. It's me, Matt Slick. I am your host today. Listen to Matt Slick Live on uh, this nice date of June 17th, 2024. If you want, you can give me a call if you dare do that. Uh, 877-207-2276. All right, so I, I got two things to talk about, all right? One is I just had a conversation on Reformed Theology with a guy on the Internet and uh, cause I'm kind of, I was kind of tired, you know. I, I, I need to be waking up. <laughs> man, it worked. And uh, this guy, oh man, he was talking stuff. And anyway, I'm gonna get to the short point. And I quoted this verse. Okay, I quoted a verse where, um, where God says, God's talking. He says, "I've sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquities of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering." forever and I asked this guy so did Jesus die for everybody and he, he actually said I was I was speaking the words of the devil <laughs> I said, dude that's what God said I just quoted it that's your interpretation I go no it's not so it was pretty bad but, but uh, wow all right well that was interesting but uh, something else is interesting here so yesterday the Roman Catholic Church has been on my heart a lot. I don't know what it is, Roman Catholics. I, I don't know why, but it's just, it's there. So, Father's Day. <laughs> Father's Day. Guess, guess what Matt Slick does for Father's Day? Hey, does he go have a steak with his wife and the kids? Ooh, well, the kids all moved out, and we did have steak last night. But I go, hey, hon, I'm going to go to the Catholic Church and listen. And so I did. And, uh, and <laughs> <laughs> my wife, you know, she looks at me with that, that weird expression she kind of develops about me when I want to go do something. I said, what? And she goes, that's your thing. And I said, yes, it is. And uh, so I said, yeah, I could just, you know, just see you talking to your girlfriends, you know. And uh, what does your husband do for entertainment? And she goes, uh, <laughs> uh you know, he's got issues. So, uh, at any rate, that's what she said. No, so I went to this this service last night, and, and I wanted to see. I'm going to do it again too. I wanted to see what's going on, and uh, so I got. I, I thought my notes were right up here in the front, but I was wrong. I had to do a search for them, and so I took notes during the entire service. I did, and it was the mass. Okay, they stood up, sit down. I didn't do any of that. I just, I was on my phone, my fold-out phone, and I was just typing stuff out and uh, keeping notes of what was going on. And so I'm going to go through a little bit of them. I can find them here real fast. Real fast. And uh, I'll tell you what, it was, it was interesting. It was interesting. Now, hold on. Let's see. Let's see right there. There we go. Um, video notes. That's right. There we go. Okay, got it. So there was about 200 people there, all right? And uh, there was a procession of people. They had the Bible held up high, and they were dressed in, I don't know, I'm not trying to mock it like that, but I guess altar, go to the altar garments, I don't know. And uh, so they placed the, the, the Bible up on the altar. Then they had a ceremony of statements with the people all reciting things in unison at particular intervals. And so they would stand up and uh, sometimes stand up, sometimes sit, and they would say something, the, the priest or whoever would say something. And I'm not trying to be flippant about this. I'm just saying this is uh, taking notes best I could. And uh, the people would just recite something, just, just say something all together at unison. Then there was a song, contemporary style. Then there was a prayer. Then they read from uh, Ezekiel. And prob I'm thinking, if I remember correctly, it's about five minutes. They talked about it just a little bit, but out of Ezekiel. And uh, then there was a song by a young girl, and uh, I think she was singing scripture. But I could, it was hard to hear, because you know my hearing isn't as good as it needs to be. The people would respond at a pause and, and sing, Lord, it is good to give thanks to you. They'd do it in a monotone. And uh, then she'd sing, and they kept doing this. 
Then another girl, or the same girl, got up and recited 2 Corinthians 5, 8, in the context of the absence of the body, home with the Lord. And then when she finished, the people recited something again. And because everybody's doing it, you know, all at once, it's hard for me to distinguish the sound, because I've told people I have hearing problems, I have hearing loss. And uh, so, you know, I just, what it is, okay? And then, uh, then another song, people singing during this time, people with candles, uh, and then a guy holding the Bible walked up to the altar. They're doing candles up there. And he read from God's Word about the Gospel. Now, this was interesting, because he read about the Gospel related to the seed bearing fruit. And uh, then people responded, then they sat down. The priest then preached, but he had a foreign accent. And I'm not knocking that, it just it made it more difficult for me to understand. And uh, so I wanted to take notes. And uh, I'm not knocking that, it's just, you know, it's just what it was. Um, so it's hard to understand. People stood up, and everyone recited our Father, etc. And I think they recited this Apostles' Creed. Okay, so this went on like this, okay? I'm going to keep going a little bit here. Hold on, turn my throat. Hold on one sec. All right, so um, then they were preparing for the Mass. They had more music. The priest held up the wafer, held up the cup, and prayed. And this is what's interesting, is as he held it up and they were doing this thing at one point during this whole thing, Oh, wait, wait, they did another song, standing. Then they all kneeled. That's right. Everyone, while the priest kept praying, they talked about the body and blood of Christ, prepping them to receive it. Hold up the wafer, and he quoted scripture. Hold up the cup, and quoted scripture. And the bell rang when he did that. And I don't know what it is. I'm assuming that's when the bread was changed into the body, and the wine is literally changed into the blood. That's what I'm assuming. Okay? Because it had more. Then another song. Then he talked about Christ and the continual living sacrifice. He mentioned Mary, the mother of God. And what was interesting is that it, I was sitting on the aisle and, you know, almost at the very back and looking, and Christ is, or Jesus is on a cross, suspended up way high, and to the front left, from my view, is a big statue of Mary with Jesus as uh, a little baby in her arms. So she's up there, not up there where the altar is, but she's up there towards it and looking towards it. And people would go up and put things on it and, and genuflect and kneel. Oh, and they would kneel before they would go sit down in the, in the pews. And uh, they finally stood up from kneeling after a while in another song. Uh, then the priest broke the wafer in half. The priest kneeled, lifted it up, and the priest drank. He gave the elements to the people who were up there dressed in... I guess the altar garments, I, I, you know, again, not trying to mock it. I'm just saying that's what it was. And uh, people then walked up forward to receive it in places in church in order to receive the elements. And I was uh, lip reading, and this one uh, woman I could see was saying, Behold the body and blood of Christ. And uh, it went on like this, okay? So stand up, sit down, a lot of that. And um, then there was applause. Everyone stand for a blessing and music, another contemporary Protestant song, the stuff we would sing. And uh, they were excused, kneeled down in the pew. Yeah, okay. And that's what happened, all right? So I skipped some stuff, but that's basically it. And um, what I noticed was, uh, what I noticed was there wasn't any real, there wasn't any preaching or teaching that I could hear that dealt with trusting in Christ, looking to Jesus. It wasn't anything like that. What I saw was ritual was uh, pomp, ceremony, stand up, sit down, kneel, sit down, recite, sit down, do the thing, do the ritual. And the Word of God is put in there, and there's, and there's, at different places it's broken up. And there was no sermon exegeting Scripture and then tying it into the need to look to Christ. But no, it was the Eucharist. Everything is about that Eucharist, getting ready for receiving the body of blood, because that's where you're going to be saved. That's where your, your sins, hopefully, will be taken care of there. And uh, so anyway, I wrote a post on Facebook. It's had 155 comments. And uh, I'm going to do some more. I'm going to walk around the block today. And what the heck is that? Look at that over there. Oh, I know what that is. That's interesting. So uh, I'm going to walk around the block and do some more uh, video about this. Um, but people are they're really responding to it because uh, most people are saying, yeah, it's bad. And I'm going to tell you, it's bad. 
And I know what Catholicism teaches, and I know it teaches a false gospel, and it does, and it promotes idolatry. And I would love to sit with those priests and just ask them direct questions and see what they would have to say. I don't think it's going to happen. But that was my idea of a good time. A lot of guys, their idea of a good time is to watch a game. You know, Ah, forget that. I'm going to go to the Catholic Church. In fact, I might go again this week just for another service, just so I can sit back and take more notes and, and stuff. Because, you know, I study it theologically. I study it from their books. And uh, But I've never been a Catholic. And no, I was not molested or beat up by a Catholic. It's nothing like that. It's just that, uh, you know, I've, I've studied their doctrines and read, I don't know, hundreds of hours of material or stuff. And, boy, it is bad. It's bankrupt. It is. It's not Christian. The Roman Catholic Church is apostate false Christianity. Let's get to Matt from North Carolina. Matt, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, Matt Slee. How you doing, man? I'm doing okay. Hanging in there. Just uh, talking smack about a false religion. What do you got, man? Hmm. I'm a Calvinist, and I believe in predestination. Okay. God chose us before the foundation of the world. God grants that we come to him. Yep. In these two areas, did God choose, I mean, did God choose us because he saw our love in him? No. He didn't? Not at all. Nope. Okay. See, I'm just, I was just, I mean, I, I, had, I had that question. It was on my mind. Huh? That's okay. Let me go here. I'm going to read you something, okay? This is James chapter 2, starting at verse 2. Now, this is a principle Mm -hmm. here. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, Mm -hmm. and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special Mm -hmm. attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes, and you say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? And so these, this idea here is interesting because this is talking about people. And we know that righteousness reflects the character of God. So we are not to judge people by their skin color, their wealth, their height, their gender. We're not to look at how many cars do they have, how, how big is the bank account, how big's the house, and judge them as worthy or not worthy of whatever, based on those things. That's prejudicial, and it's sinful. Now, some people would say that God's going to look into the future, and he's going to pick the ones who will choose him. Now, that's a, there's a problem. There's two problems there. One is, then God's choice depends upon man's choice, and that's not how it works. God makes his choices before we were born. And that's what the Bible says. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we be holy and blameless. Well, people don't like that. What they want is people, mm-hmm. what they want to say, no, God has to know the goodness of my heart and the goodness of other people's hearts. That's why he picks them. And they reject the idea that God is the sovereign king. They reject that. They want their own sovereignty. And so that's one problem. And they get back, and I'll show you another problem. And then we can talk a little more, okay? So hold on, buddy. Hey, folks, if you want to give me a call, it's 877-207-2276. We'll be right back. Please stay tuned. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. If you want to give me a call, all I have to do is dial 877-207-2276. Matt, welcome. You're on the air, buddy. Yeah, I'm back. All right. Now, the second reason uh, this is a problem is uh, the idea that God looks and chooses and all that, those who are going to save, uh, serve him and, and choose him, is that the Bible says that the unbeliever is a slave of sin, Romans six fourteen through 20, a hater of God who does no good, Romans 3, 10, 11, 12. He's dead in his sins, Ephesians 2, 1, and is by nature a child of wrath, Ephesians 2, 3. And he uh, is 
his heart's desperately wicked and deceitful, Jeremiah 17, 9, and he cannot receive spiritual things, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. So it's not, there isn't any reality to the idea that he'll look into the future to see who'll pick him. Nobody will. This is why the Bible says that God grants that we have faith, Philippians 1, 29, and Jesus says in John 6, 45, or excuse me, John 6, 65, he says, you cannot come to me unless it's granted to you from the Father. 1 Peter 1, 3 says God uh, caused us to be born again. We're born again, not of our own will, John 1, 13. This is stuff people don't like, but that's what it says, okay? All right, all right. Thank you, man. Right. Thanks for crying up for me. Okay, and uh, just remember, study God's Word. Look to what God's Word says. And, uh, you know, everything that I say you must uh, just take with a, a grain of salt, okay? Always look to God's right. Word, all right? All right, okay. thank you, Matt. Okay, God bless, buddy. Bye. All right. So, hey, folks, we have uh, no, excuse me, nobody waiting right now. If you want to give me a call, all you have to do is dial 877-207-2276. Eight, I want to hear from you. Give me a call. You can also email me, and that's easy to do. Just uh, email to, uh, let's see, that would be uh, info at karm.org. Info at karm.org. And uh, just put in the subject line, radio comment or radio questions and then we can get to your stuff okay pretty easy to do right oh yeah it is all right there you go so um uh, let's see um by the way you know, i'm just going to say this that uh uh i have uh, facebook p post uh, pages and stuff matt slick and facebook and also karm.org and uh so uh, during the break i put some more stuff up on facebook on matt slick i think it's matt slick page you can follow and you can see I've already got well over 5,000 or I got 5,000 is a limit and um, that hit that a long time ago so anyway um, what I think I'll do now is uh, oh that's right thanks for reminding me Laura thank you I appreciate that okay th th uh, this Friday I'm not going to be on the air I'm going to be driving down to Salt Lake City uh, so it'll be a recorded show on Friday and I'm going to be in a debate with Andrew Rappaport uh, on Saturday evening at 6 p.m. and it will be at the Utah Christian Research Center and uh, so we're going to, I'll be debating with him on the issue of the charismatic gifts are they for today I say yes they are he says no they're not now he and I are friends it'll be an interesting discussion I will insult each other because we do you know we're friends but uh, if you want information on it, you can go to utahchristianresearchcenter.com. It's all, it's all one word, no spaces, no hyphens. Utah Christian Research Center. So utahchristianresearchcenter.com. And I'll give the address out here if you want to write it down or record something. But it's all there on that website. And Andrew's going to be there, um, I think, uh, Thursday and Friday night. Uh, doing some teaching or something like that. I may get there in time to see him on Friday, and if I do, then I'll I'll just stand in the back and mock him, or you know, uh, when he says something, I'll just put, I'll slap my forehead, shake my head, you know, just good good stuff like that. So uh, the address is five seven nine Galena Park Place. Galena is G A L E N A Park Place, Suite one hundred one in Draper, Utah, or Utah. And the phone number there is 385-237-3649. Um, I think i got to put that up on the uh, on, on the debate thing. I'll do that maybe during the break. I can do so many things during the break and stuff like that. So there you go, Utah Christian Research Center. Let's see what happens when I click on that. And it's opening up. It's really nice. It's nicely set up, what they've done. They, do, they did a great job. And there's Bill McKeever on the front. And uh, he's a good guy. I hope he does not hear me say that because, you know, I want to you know, get his head puffed up. But no, he's a good guy. So is Eric Johnson. Uh, they're, they're great guys. So there you go. Uh, UtahChristianResearchCenter.com, and that'll be everything you need right there. All right, if you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276. I want to hear from you. Give me a call, please. And um, we can blab. 
All right, be careful, Matt. This guy ain't. ain't what? I'm not sure what. To, I'm looking at the. Uh, at the, oh, I see. Okay, I go looking at the chat room, and that reminds me. If you want to volunteer, not volunteer, but if you want to join us in the chat, we have some great people in there, and we have a lot of fun. So that's you just that's easy to do. Just go to rumble.com, rumble.com forward slash Matt Slick Live, all one word, no hyphens, and you can you can check it out right there, and uh, and be interested. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is get to some of the questions because we have nobody waiting right now. Get to some of the questions, radio questions that have been sent in, and uh, we'll see if we can answer some of them. All right, here we go. Let's see. Um, yeah, Ronald Reagan Jr. talked to that last week. How can a church say they lean Arminian when they preach all the election <laughs> and predestination verses? I don't know. You have to see what that particular church is doing and how they're interpreting things. Because I was talking to a guy uh, just a little bit ago, an hour-ish ago. He was so rude and condescending. Oh, man. And uh, it was really bad. And so uh, people will, what they'll do is they'll say predestination election and then they redefine it in some weird way uh and then that's how they do it i guess at any rate so let's see how about this uh moses saw the form of god yes he did you can go to exodus 24 9 to 11 for that moses aaron native and abihu and 70 of the elders of israel went up and they saw the god of israel and under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of, sa- of sapphire as clear as the sky itself, yet he did not stretch out his hands against the sons of the nobles of Israel. They beheld God and they ate and they drank. You also go to Numbers 12, 6 through 8, uh, where God says, uh, If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, want to make myself known to him in a vision or a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household, and with him I speak openly and not in dark sayings that he beholds the form of the Lord. That's what it says right there. You can go check it out. That was, uh, flip, I mean, um, Numbers 12, uh, 2 through 6, 6 through 8, 6 through 8. Okay, let's get to Todd from Philly. Hey, Todd, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, Matt, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to call in here. First of all, I just want to say I'm kind of new to the apologetic space and definitely your debates and everything you have over at Karma has been a big help. So I just definitely just want to say thank you for all that you've been doing over the past 40 years. It's been great. Amen. Oh, hey, hold on, there's a break, there's the music, so hold on, buddy, <laughs> okay, and we'll Sounds get back after the break, all right, there's the timing there, all right, hey folks, we'll be right back after these messages, if you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276, we'll be right back. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. If you want to give me a call, all you have to do is dial 877-207-2276. Let's get back on the air with Todd from Philly. Hey, Todd, welcome. You're on the air. Yep, yep. thanks for having me again, Matt. Yeah, so I'm a Trinitarian, and kind of one of the things that I've been curious about recently is kind of how should I understand this word monogamy? Because kind of like the way that I've taught it kind of to my Sunday school kids is the idea that, you know, the Father and the Son have always existed co-eternally alongside with each other. Mm -hmm. But then I was actually having a conversation with one of my friends who was saying, well, no, no, you should actually explain it as the son was actually brought forth of the father. So I was always wondering, well, the term monogamous, from what I've studied, kind of just means unique and one of a kind. So I was always of the mind that there was at no point where the father physically, you know, begot Jesus, but maybe I should be thinking of it a little bit differently. So I thought I would call in and get uh, your opinion on that. All right. So uh, monogamous is used uh, in John three sixteen, only begotten, mono, and from genao to beget, only begotten. Now there's a diphthong form that occurs when you have in Greek two words that the first one ends with a vowel and the next one begins with a vowel and then they're merged together, it's called a diphthong, and then there's a rule to how the vowels combine to get a different vowel or sometimes one of the two vowels. 
And this occurs with only begotten. It also occurs with unique. The word only begotten is a diphthong form, and it's spelled the same way as the word unique. So there's like a pun going on in the Greek. All right, whatever. So one of the issues here we have to understand in divine simplicity is this. So let me lay down the foundation here. Divine simplicity is a teaching that God himself exists as a simple thing. The simple one thing is a trinity. That the trinity has always existed as a single thing. Always. This is the nature of God called divine simplicity. There was no time when God was not a trinity. There's no condition in which he was not a trinity. If someone says that the Son is brought forth, then we have some issues. To say that the Son proceeds from the Father, and some there's been a lot of debate about this, that the eternal procession, and then there's logical issues that go with it. Let's see if I can work through this without being making it too complicated. So it seems to be, in one sense, that the, the Son and the Spirit are brought forth from the Father, yet at the same time, they're eternal. And this, these statements are interesting. So let me step sideways and talk about logical versus temporal procession or priority. So the illustration I use is a light bulb with electricity. So in temporal priority, we flip the switch, electricity goes into the light bulb, and in this case, five seconds later, light appears. That would be temporal priority. With electricity is there, a duration of time occurs, and then something new is there, the light. Mm -hmm. That's called temporal priority. Logical priority is different. Logical priority is this, that when the electricity is in the light bulb, they're both simultaneous. They're at the same time. One is not temporally before the other but one is logically prior. What we mean by that is, though they are simultaneous, the electricity is the cause of the light. And so therefore, we would say that electricity is logically prior, even though temporally they're simultaneous. Make sense so far? Yep, yep, I got you. Okay. So some of the discussions about the doctrine of the Trinity and the procession of the Son deals with what I believe or I understand to be logical priority. So there's issues with this as well, but it's the idea that the nature of God has always been that the Father is the procedure, where the Son is a, is a procession and the Spirit is spirated, the breathing forth. And I don't like to get into these very much because I think it's too dangerous philosophically and theologically because I think it's possible to end up in some errors. So some have stated the idea that the eternal nature of God is that the Son and the Spirit were brought forth from the Father, but they were always existing. How does that work? I don't know. What I like to believe is uh, this, that in the divine simplicity of the Trinity, God has always existed as one simple thing, the Trinitarian thing, the Trinitarian nature. There was never a time when God was not Trinitarian. Now, how that works inside the Trinity, I stay away from it. I don't want to get too close because I don't want to accidentally say something that's not right about God. So I say, if there's a procession, which the Bible talks about it, but then there's the issue of what does it mean? <laughs> this is not an easy topic. What does it mean by procession? So in John eight forty two, Jesus says, if God were your father, you would love me for I proceeded forth and have come from God. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, did he proceed forth in the human sense? Did he proceed forth in the being sent sense? Did he proceed forth from the eternal sense? Well, that can have two meanings as well, because in the early and in, in the anti—I mean, not anti—in the eternal Trinitarian essence, 
it could have always been decided that the son would be the one who would proceed from heaven to earth to be incarnate and so we could have the eternal procession could be understood that way okay some have said from that eternal nature that the, the son how it was preceded and brought forth eternally in the beginning from eternity past I don't understand what they mean by that because when I read stuff like this and I've read this years ago I get lots of questions how does it what sense how does this work because there's different ways you can understand this okay so it's difficult all right so the reason I'm bringing this up is not to confuse you I don't want to confuse you uh, but uh, it's not an easy topic it deals with the inner workings of the eternal trinity and i think we need to be careful and so my summary is simple god is one simple thing trinitarian he's always been trinitarian the father sent the son the father and son send the holy spirit the sending has always been in place eternally and it was ratified and materialized in our world so God eternally existed Trinitarianally-ish, to really mess up a word there, but we perceive him as three distinct simultaneous co-eternal persons. But God himself is one being who ultimately has one mind, one soul, one substance. Yet that one substance is three persons. And whew, so you can see how this is just not easy. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got right. you. I got you. So just real quick, though, so when we use the term eternally begotten, does that just refer to the idea that the Father had always eternally decreed that the Son would be the one begotten, or is there something different that I'm missing there? Yes, that's that's right. You're on the right track. Which is it? And some call it the eternal generation of the Son. So I've written an article on this. And uh, it's a teaching that the Son is eternally begotten by the necessary will of the Father, but that the Son is not created or caused, and that neither the Son nor the Holy Spirit is dependent upon the Father or any other member of the Godhead for existence. The eternal generation of the Son is a statement on the relationship within the Trinity between the Father and the Son before the Incarnation. Therefore, the term is not in reference to causation, but to nature and relationship. The eternal generation of the Son must be understood to mean that the Father did not bring the Son into existence, which would deny the full immutability and deity of the Son, etc. Okay? I wrote that. Wrote that uh, 10 years ago. So, okay? Yeah, I'll definitely give that a read. Thanks so much, Matt. I really appreciate it. Okay, man. Yeah, it's just, it's a tough one. And I got more complicated than it really kind of needed to be. But I, what I did, yeah. when I wrote that article, I remember really researching it. And I have quotes from different sources, uh, outlines in theology by Hodge, by Dabney, by Roberts. We've got antithesis and this and that. So I went in and, uh, and did that. And uh, so my, my recommendation is, is don't really go much beyond what's written there. And don't try mm -hmm. and solve anything because, well, we're just finite. We can't really do that, you know. Get as close as you can and just say, well, the rest I don't get. That's okay. All right? Gotcha, gotcha. All right. Thanks again, Matt. Definitely God bless you and your ministry. Hey, man, thanks. And God bless, buddy. Okay. All right. All right well, that was Todd. That's a good question. Really was a good question. One of the deep ones. And, uh, hey, we have four, three open lines, 877-207-2276. We'll be right back, please. Stay tuned. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. If you want to give me a call, all I have to do is dial 877-207-2276. So who said that? Uh, Joanne says, I like to hear Matt laugh. People have told me my laugh is infectious. I don't know if it is or not, but... Uh. Okay, Elijah. Hey, welcome, man. You're on the air. Hey, Matt. Uh, my question today is 
uh, out of First Corinthians uh, 118. Um, mm-hmm. I saw a debate recently on, I think it was Standing for Truth, if I remember correctly, and um, and uh, the Orthodox guy uh, position was that, um, well, actually, no, uh, this is a live stream, and an Orthodox guy joined in, and basically uh, his position is that um, salvation is a process, while yeah. you know, you know Donnie's position is that salvation is instantaneous, and um, and so, so 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 this is the verse that he brought up to prove his point. But then the the, the a guy that was on Donnie's team brought up the King James version, which says uh, it says that uh, the, those who are saved, but but all the other translations uh, say those who are being saved, and so and, and so you know his point was that these different trans the King James version, yeah. all the other translations. You'll mm-hmm. you'll come out with, with different doctrines. So it's like, well, what is your thoughts on this? Okay, so that's called a perfect passive participle. Okay, in the Greek, uh, present. It's going to be present passive, not perfect. Present passive participle, present tense. Passive means it's happening to them, and participle means an ongoing action. I n g word. So the best translation is they are being saved. Now. The phrase being saved does not necessitate a process of individuals who earn salvation, maintain salvation, or regain salvation. It's not about any individual doing more and more to end up being saved. The verse is speaking about all kinds of people being saved. Some are saved one day, and more are being saved the next day, and so on. And that's what's going on there. The false teaching of the Eastern Orthodox guy is because I know what they teach and Eastern Orthodoxy also preaches a false gospel the same as Roman Catholicism because what they're teaching is that salvation both of them are teaching salvation is a process and what it mean and I'll generically blend the wording for both of them you have to do stuff in ceremonies and attitudes and stuff in order to become Christ like more and more to eventually get saved to eventually make it and it's a false gospel. Both those churches are preaching a false gospel, a gospel that cannot save them. Okay. All right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a good, a good, a good uh, point. And um, uh, not long after I had watched that, I had, I had thought of this uh, rebuttal to, to, to say to Catholics or Orthodox who say that uh, Protestants should join, uh, you know, one of their churches because. Nope. Because uh, they, because uh, they can trace their uh, churches back to uh, the, the apostolic age, and uh, and uh, my rebuttal would be, and and, and uh, you can tell me what you think about it. Uh, my, my my rebuttal would be uh, that uh, okay, okay, you want to say uh, these churches are apostolic because they can trace their lineage, lineage back to the first century, but uh, the, the churches in Galatia were also apostolic, and they and they went astray, started preaching a, a false gospel. So so would yep. you join? the churches of, of, of Galatia uh, just because they're apostolic? Exactly. Very good point. You know? Good good point. Yep. That's right. And here's, it, it's called a pedigree. Okay, so I don't I don't grant that they trace themselves back. And But sometimes I'll talk to them and I'll say, let's just say that you can, that you have a lineage of, of people's names that goes all the way back to, to Peter. Let's just say it. Um, my question is, yeah, so what? What does that mean? Does it mean you're true? Does it mean everything you preach and teach is biblical? Because you have some lineage? Are you putting your authority back to your lineage? Why don't you go to Scripture and tell me what the truth is? Why do you have to look to your church's history, your church's lineage, your church's authority? Because that's what these false religions do, is they functionally replace Jesus with their church. I listen to Catholic radio a lot because I I go to places. I just enjoy listening to Catholic radio. I I like listening to heresy. And so they continually say, come home to the church. It's about the church. And that's what Eastern Orthodoxy is too. The church, their organization, they are the descendants, they have the lineage of the true church. Therefore, we're the true ones. That's what they say. It's ridiculous. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I think I think I think the response that they often give is um, is, is uh, they say no salvation uh, out of the church. Uh, I think I think there's a scripture that they give for it, but I can't remember. Uh, do you remember if there's a scripture that that they give for that? For what? 
about about their argument uh, that there's no salvation uh, outside of the church. So like, so, like, so oh. because, because there's a scripture that they point to, but I just can't remember it. I don't know uh, of any verse in the Bible that says there's no salvation outside the church. Because what they mean by that is their particular church. There's no salvation outside right. of Jesus. Always think of it in this terms. What is the central thing in their lives? The church or Jesus? It's just that simple. One of the things I'll do, I, I, I say to them, and, and I'll say this again, I say, I'm going to prove to you to the Eastern Orthodoxy and the Roman Catholics, I'm going to prove to you they're more loyal to your church than to Jesus. And they say, you can't do that. And I said, yes, I can. I'll prove it to you. doesn't mean they'll be persuaded, but I'm going to prove it. And I'll say, look, can I ask you some questions? And they say, okay. I say, is Jesus God in flesh? And they say, yes. Okay. And uh, does he have all authority in heaven and earth? Yes. I know the scripture references that they have any doubts. I quote them to him. So, yes, he does. Okay. Does he say, come to me? Y yes. Can you pray to him? Yes. Does he forgive sins? Yes. Now, here's my question. If you were to pray strictly to Jesus, not Mary, not going to a priest, just on your knees, whatever, sincere, contrite heart before the Lord Jesus, you ask Jesus to forgive you of all of your sins. Will he forgive you of all of your sins? That's the question I ask. And you know what they tell me? 80%, 90% will say, you have to go to the church. The, Jesus set up the church. you got to go to the priesthood. you got to go to this. You gotta, that's what they do right away. I, I keep bringing them back to Jesus. Can you go to Jesus? Some of the times they'll say yes. I say, good. So you're telling me then that if you pray directly to Jesus, he'll forgive you of all of your sins? And they'll say yes. I say, why do you need your priesthood? Because that's what he set up normally for us to do. And it, they can't get away from it. And once I was talking to, uh, I think it was a Catholic, and uh, I said, I was very sincere, you know, I, I wasn't trying to mock him. I said, would you be willing to pray to Jesus to uh, to have Jesus forgive you of all of your sins? I, I told him repeatedly, I'm not mocking you. I am, I, I am not going to doubt the sincerity of your prayer. It's a serious thing. But would you be willing, online here publicly, because I, I would certainly do it, and pray to Jesus and ask Jesus to forgive you of all of your sins. He said, yeah, he'll do it. I said, okay, great. Okay, uh, with humility, I'll, I'll, I'll listen. And he said, uh, he went to the prayers, he goes, uh, uh, Mary, I ask that you would blah, blah, blah. Went straight to Mary. And I waited till he was done. And I said, I said, you didn't even go to Christ. They can't do it because they're indoctrinated. They're indoctrinated. It's bad. It's bad. Okay. Oh uh, yeah. Um. So, um. I just found an interesting verse. Uh, it's out of Second uh, Corinthians. Um. Hold on a second. Second Corinthians. I just had it. Second Corinthians right. two ten. It says, uh, "Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have." forgiven anything has been for your sake in the presence of right. Christ. So, um, uh, it's, uh, I, I, know, I know you believe that the uh, spiritual gifts are still for today, and I also believe that yep. too. So if if, if if all the gifts are still continue today, uh, uh, wouldn't this mean that this also is for today? I'm, I'm sure a Catholic would probably try to argue for that. Well, they, their idea of forgiveness is that the church has the authority to forgive because it has the true priesthood, which there is no priesthood like that in the New Testament. They're in the Old Testament under the law, a preach a false gospel. And so they'll say that, that uh, you know, they'll go to John twenty twenty three, they'll go to Matthew sixteen eighteen, they go to various verses, and I put them in context and show it doesn't say what they say. And uh, they might use this verse, but not very often. Uh, if you forgive, he says he forgives also. He's just talking about generic forgiveness among Christians. We're to do that. That's what it is. But the Roman Catholic Church and the East Orthodox Church claim to have specific authority as organizations on earth, that they are the true church and that they can, because they have authority, they can forgive sins. Yeah, instead of going to Jesus, you go to the church. That's the difference. 
instead of going to Christ, you go to the church. Yeah. And it's bad news. Yeah. Both of them are preaching false gospels. Okay. Uh, 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 last question, uh, because I know you got to go. Uh, uh, I just sure. need a yes or no. Uh, did you did you uh, write that article that you say you were going to write last week about, I think it was in Second Thessalonians and Revelation 14.10 about, about oh. in the presence versus away from the presence? No, I didn't write it. Um, and uh, But I have it in my notes. I put it in my, here we go, I'm looking for it. Right, I'm looking, where is it? I have it in my notes. Yep, right there. Second uh, Thessalonians 1 9 with Revelation 14 10. That's my notes to write. But I got a debate I'll be in uh, in Utah, so I'm prepping on that right now, putting everything else on hold, kind of. A th- well, not everything, but you know. So I got to get to it. And it's in my list. And the problem is, I put 10 more things before it. <laughs> I, gotta keep going. Well, I can do this too. I can do that one too. So, uh, but I'll get to it, man. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Whew. Man, there's That's so much one. to do. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no! Oh, oh no! I said, I said, I said, uh, have a good day. Okay, man. You too. God bless, buddy. All right. All right. All right. Well, hey. Um, there you go. You know what? Uh, so. I'm dead serious about what I'm saying about Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. I'm not prejudicial. This is completely dealing with theology and what they teach. You know, for example, in paragraph 2060 to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says, you attain salvation through faith, baptism, and the observance of the commandments. The observance of the commandments. Romans 3.28 says, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Romans 4, 5 says, To the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. You see, the Roman Catholic Church preaches a false gospel. It doesn't take, it's not joyous for me to say it. I don't take pleasure in saying it. It's sad. Roman Catholics are subjects of evangelism. And what I need to do is teach how to witness to them. Not that I'm anything great, but I'm going to put some stuff together and uh, and work on, on on it all the more and I've been collecting notes on Catholicism for quite a while and my notes on Catholicism let's see how many pages 224 pages uh, that's in Microsoft Word in outline form and always growing there's the music I am out of here may the Lord bless you and uh, trust in Jesus Jesus alone not Jesus and your baptism or sacraments or works or commandments Jesus alone he did everything he's sufficient he's God in flesh he did it all look to him alone amen hey folks I'm out of here may the Lord bless you talk to you tomorrow by his grace another program powered by the truth network